last week, we had the unfortunate situation where one of our eminent speakers had to drop out at very short notice. But we were in the very lucky position that we had someone who was able uh, to step into the breach very quickly and just prepare a talk, which was going to be outstanding, I know, at very short notice at the end of last week. So we're particularly delighted that Emma Teeling from UCD, who works on zoology and particularly on bat studies, which has lots of insight into the future of zoology, which is going to be the topic she's going to talk about. She's going to talk on this topic now, but you have to bear in mind that, she, well, the talk is going to be fantastic. It's going to be even more appreciable because of the short notice that she's had to prepare. So we're delighted that Emma was able to step into the breach, and Emma's now going to talk about the future of zoology. Okay, <laughs> so first of all, I want to thank the organizers. I feel so privileged to be able to share this stage with some of my scientific heroes. So thank you very much, and I was very glad to step into this breach. And what I, what I want to do today is I want to talk to you about how studying some of the diverse, wonderful animal creatures that we have on this planet can allow us to find solutions to some of society's greatest problems and therefore make human life better. And also, it can allow us to understand our place in the diversity of life on this planet. What makes us human? What makes us different from the other animals? How have we evolved? But first of all, think about what Schrodinger was thinking about all for a very long time and has inspired this entire symposium. It is what is life? Well, life is the group of all things on this planet that are actually alive. That's what life is. And we're profoundly interested in where do we fall within this group of living organisms. And it's estimates today there are about 9 million eukaryotic organisms or multicellular organisms. That's lots of them, potentially. But we, it's estimated that we don't actually know the existence and haven't documented about 80% of these. And as Beth Shapiro said yesterday, we're heading towards this great extinction, that potentially there are some eukaryotes alive on this planet that we don't know, and they're going to go extinct before we even describe them. Now, two million of these diverse species are animals. And what zoology is, it's not just going to a zoo and playing with lovely furry tiger cubs. What zoology is, it's the study of animal biology. It's the branch of biology that studies the animal kingdom, including the structure, embryology, evolution, classification, habits and distribution of all animals, both living and extinct. And it's how they interact with their ecosystems. So zoology, zoology is an extremely integrative biological subject. And now with the tools that we have available in 2018, diverse tools that come from physics and chemistry and biology, work that's done in humans and model species, we can now address some of these questions that have faced zoologists since the dawn of this subject. But who cares? You know, who cares about animals? We need to care because we are animals. And if you want to understand what is life and what makes us humans, we need to study our closest ancestors and understand how they evolved, because we're just another animal in this giant compendium of animal species, of the two million that we estimate are alive today in our planet. This question of where does humanity fall out in this great animal kingdom has really perturbed zoologists for years. Linnaeus, Haeckel, Darwin drew one of the first trees ever. And typically what you see would be a tree drawn like this. Man, not woman, man, at the very top. You have your mammals, other vertebrates, protists, and things that probably aren't as important right at the base of all of life. But we need to understand how life has evolved and where do we fall in it. And this was a tree that was shown yesterday by Daniel Bennett. And again, what you'll see in this little red box here, if you look along the bottom axis here, this is millions of years ago. This is an attempt to depict the diversity of all of life, how it's evolved, and where we fall. And down in that little red box, right at today, that's us, that's our species. So all of this evolution has happened in the past that's modified us to exist in the environment we do today, for our brains to function the way they are, for us to think about are we here now in the present. This has all happened in the past. 
but we need to try and understand what's happened in the past to understand the present, to predict the future, as we've just talked about yesterday. Now, what we have done as zoologists is try to understand the past by looking at the present. And typically, zoologists use the tools that were at hand at the time. And they want to understand what type of animals were humans most like. They use comparative anatomy, looking at bone structure, comparative physiology, where do the different muscles interact, where do the different processes, are they similar in a human or a chimp or a cat or an echinoderm or starfishes? How do we all relate to each other? And Heckel used a lot of embryology, looking at the developing embryo to see could we find the secrets of the evolutionary process that could explain our life, where humans have evolved from and where we came from. What was our relationship to the other animals? And for zoologists, and this really, this excites me a lot, this picture. And so the next four, because zoologists are very interested in the diversity of animal life. And in the 1800s, Darwin's work, going out trying to describe and look at all species. And these are pictures taken from the back of the museum. This is the Natural History Museum in uh, the Smithsonian, should I say, in Washington. And as you can see, there are trays upon trays upon trays of beautiful birds, of insects, of crustaceans, of echinoderms, of all of life, whereby the zoologists are trying to understand, to look at the tree of life to work out where do we fall. You could have lots of big space if you want to look at things like whales. But really, when you go down into the deep, dark recesses of these natural history museums, you're kind of met with the smell of alcohol, because we preserved as much of life as we can try and describe in these great big jars. But there's a little problem. And the problem is we want to look at these morphological, physiological structures between different organisms. But how can you look at a leg of a starfish, a little foot of a starfish, a foot of a butterfly, our foot? They're not, how do you understand, are they the same structures? How have they evolved? And looking at morphology and anatomy and physiology has its restrictions, because what is the same character in all these different organisms that we can now trace its evolution? So it's difficult. And this is where I get on to Schrodinger and what is life. So I've read this book, and there are certain lines that really, I suppose, appeal to me as a zoologist and a geneticist. And the first of this, and again, Nick Lane showed this, and maybe we're all very excited by this, it is on page 20. These chromosomes contain in some kind of code script the entire pattern of the individual's future development and functioning. It is solidity on which we draw to account for the permanence of the gene. So we believe a gene to be an aperiodic solid. That's cool. This is one of the, at the time, this was in early 1940s, Schrodinger was thinking about what was life? How could life be contained? How was it replicated? How was it coded? And I think really what happens is that at that time, there was some form of science consciousness that was happening. Because in the 10 years before and 10 years after, many researchers were beginning to understand that it was DNA, potentially not protein, that was inherited. And that a lot of this work by Chagraff, by Avery, by Mendel, and then by these four people who really brought this consciousness to a head. James Watson, Francis Crick, Rosalind Franklin, Morris Wilkins, an integration of physicists, biologists, and chemists, and they were able to really bring all of this scientific consciousness to a head and discover, of course, DNA. And we now need to go back into the dark recesses of my downstairs toilet and to show that, yes, Watson and Crick were inspired by Schrodinger's book. And I go to here, this is a, it hangs in our downstairs bathroom. And it's a letter by Francis Crick to Schrodinger, who lives in Clontarf, or did live there, that's where I live now, on the 12th of August, 1953. Dear Professor Schrodinger, Watson and I were once discussing how we came to enter the field of molecular biology, and we discovered that we had both been influenced by your little book, What is Life? They were influenced. We thought you might be interested in the enclosed reprints. You will see that it looks as though your term, aperiodic crystal, is going to be a very apt one. That's extraordinary. It's totally brilliant. Yes, it's a very apt one. Because it describes DNA. DNA is the raw material of inheritance. It is the material of all of life. And to be able to understand how it replicates, how it functions, how it leads to make us who we are, allows us to determine how we interact with our environment, that stuff's magic, really. It's the essence of life. So they were right. 
But what I also was struck by when I read this book, it wasn't just DNA that Schrodinger was describing. I, th I think each different scientist takes from it what they want when they read these lines. An organism's astonishing gift of controlling a stream of order on itself, and thus escaping the decay of uh, atomic chaos. Existing order displays the power of maintaining itself and producing orderly events. So when I read this, to me, this describes genome organization. The code for how cells can develop to make an organism, and how the organism needs to maintain itself. And I want you to think this idea for, for a moment. Hold on to it. And I think Schrodinger was describing a genome. So what's our genome? So it's the complement of DNA you find in every one of your cells. It's a blueprint for who you are and how you'll interact with your environment. But life is specified by genomes. Every organism, including humans, has a genome that contains all of the biological information needed to build and maintain a living example of that organism. You can look at the genome of a fruit fly, of a starfish, of a bat, of a black-footed ferret. The, the blueprint to make that individual, that individual species, is maintained in the genome. The biological information contained in a genome is included in its uh, deoxyribonucleic acid, or its DNA. It's divided into a discrete unit called genes. So this described our genome. It's very interesting because, again, I want you to think about it. It's very important to maintain the structure of that genome. I'm going to argue that evolution doesn't like change that much. You know, once an organism has adapted to its environment, it's better to stop changing if the environment, if you're perfectly adapted to your environment. What has happened, as you've seen over and over again, is that the cost of being able to sequence your genome and cover the blueprint that underlies all organisms, it's dropping exponentially. And now they've argued in 2018 that potentially you can sequence your entire genome for even less than $1,000 for about 300. Now, what does that mean? That means we can all have our genome sequenced. But what does that mean for zoology? That meant that really starting about 20, 2001, 2002, we were able now to go and ask the question, well, what's the genome of all these diverse animals? And so there's work that I was involved in with trying to uncover, all right, where do humans fall in our tree of life? And it was work that we started to, instead of looking at anatomy and physiology, we're now able to look at genes and reconstruct evolutionary history. And when we did this, we tried, found that mammals were organized into four main groups. Humans fell in this group, Eurocontiglaries, and this was work done uh, by Bill Murphy, by Mark Springer, Stephen O'Brien, work we were all involved in. So we rewrote the evolutionary history of mammals. You keep going, what happens? You add more and more taxes, so do you still find the same answer? And we did. And what we found is that humans were primates, we fall in this group called Eurocontiglaries, along with flying lemurs, this is your order Demoptera, tree shrews, order Scanodentia, rodents, and rabbits. And yes, humans are more like rats than we are like cats. But what did this mean? Now we had a tree. We understood, well, where did humans fall in relation to mammals and other parts of life? And still there are ongoing debates looking at the very base of the origin of life. But looking at DNA and RNA, we will be able to reconstruct it. What that meant was that now we had an evolutionary path. We had a, a network, we had a direction. How did things happen in the past? Even better, supported by, by anatomical, physiological, genetic data. And what we were able to do then is look at these unique adaptations that you see. I'm going to give you an example just within mammals. Look at things that could fly, swim, that evolved different solutions, different tools to deal with the environment they were faced in and that we were going to be able to uncover, well, what were the genes that underlay these tools? And then maybe we could say, OK, what do you need to do to, say, for example, fight aging, not get cancer? What have these unique organisms evolved? Now, once we understood what the blueprint was, potentially maybe we could use this to be able to make us more like those animals. So Darwin talked about nature's experiments. So each different species have evolved different solutions to uh, exist in their environment. And those solutions lie in the genome of these diverse animals. And I'm going to talk to you today about something I've been working on, and I know we're going to hear lots from um, Linda Partridge about healthy aging. And I'm going to talk to you about how studying very diverse organisms, which are bats, 
the most fantastic of all living animals, how they can address a problem that society faces, and that's healthy aging. And so it's been predicted that a baby born today is going to live until they're 150 years of age if they're born in the, the, a healthy Western environment. Now, there's a problem with this. And the problem with this is that our populations are aging. They're aging, aging, aging. We're able to live way longer than we used to be able to live for. The World Health Organization has estimated that by 2050, there's going to be a 300% increase in people over the age of 80. Now, this sounds great. It's like a utopia. But there's a problem. And our problem that is our time of onset of age-related diseases, arthritis, uh, diabetes, Alzheimer's, it still has stayed the same. So we're able to live for way longer. But it's a much more morbid way of living. Morbidity rather than mortality. So we do not want our future societies to be full of the incapacitated elderly. We need to find a way that we can match our health span with our new projected lifespan. So how do we do this? There's been lots and lots of fantastic research done on model organisms, on the likes of C. elegans, of fruit flies, on lab mice. And while these are wonderful, and you find that the aging process is highly regulated and mediated by conserved signaling pathways and transcription factors, so you can look at how aging happens in these different organisms, the problem is, is I think we've been thinking about this a little bit wrong. So we've had to pick these lab, lab organisms because what you want to do is you want to have an organism that's going to have lots and lots of babies. It's not going to live for so long, so you can study the generation time of that organism in your own lifetime. But really, our lab organisms have been chosen because they're very bad at living. They're very good at dying. Think about it. And so you want to study how you can age more healthily in something that doesn't live longer naturally. And also, they're quite inbred. But we have no other choice. This is what we had to do. But I'm thinking that now, in 2018, when we have all these new advancements and these tools at our fingertips so we can uncover the genome of these diverse animals, that now we can address this question using potentially more appropriate species. So this is Methuselah's zoo. Methuselah was a biblical character that lived over 900 years. And these are some of the species that hold the record for longevity. The vertebrate that's estimated to live the longest is the Greenland shark, living over 512 years. You have weird things like this rough-eye rockfish, turtles, ohms, ocean quaghogs. So these are our real Methuselahs. But I'm going to argue that actually they're not doing anything that you wouldn't expect. They live very slow and very cold environments. They don't reach sexual maturity until they're about 150. It might be a bit depressive, but that's what it's estimated. But I'm going to argue that actually what we really should be studying are mammals that can live way longer than expected. And of course, these are the bats, beautiful, glorious creatures. One in five of all living mammals today are bats. They exist all around the globe. They're missing from the um, very cold polar regions. But what's important is that bats are the only mammals that have achieved the ability of true self-powered flight. Now, flight is highly, highly metabolically costly. And this is un unique, and you would assume that bats as they expend three to ten times more energy over the course of their lifetime than a similar-sized mammal, you expect that they should have short lives. But they don't. And bats are quite unique. So when you correct for body size, because typically in nature, small things have a high metabolic rate, live fast, die young. Nick Lane was talking about the problem of these highly energetic mitochondria. Big things live slow, live long. Think of a bowhead whale and a shrew. But bats book this trend. Because the, oh, a bat that was caught as an adult, this is my oldest Branty, caught as an adult, tagged, released, caught 43 years later, showed no signs of aging. And indeed, when you start to study bats in this way, ring them and recatch them, you see they can live for a very long time, way longer than expected. There are 19 species of mammal that live longer than man given their body size, and 18 of these are bats. One's a naked mole rat, also shows unique characteristics. But I wanted to I thought about this, and I thought, well, we need to study these wild bats as an alternative model to uncover the molecular pathways that can underlie extraordinary aging in mammals. And I've been working on this for the past eight years. And what we do, I'm going to show you, is that we go out into the field in France, we catch a population of these long-lived bats, large enough that I can take a non-lethal sample, bring it back to my lab, and sequence it. And here's 
We work with this grassroots organization, Britannia Vivante, and we catch the same individual year after year after year. We catch them as a baby. The only way you can age a bat is when its finger bones are not fused. We catch it as a baby, we take a little bit of blood, we take a little bit of, of wing, take less than 140 microliters of blood, we flash freeze these, and we bring them back to my lab in UCD. And you can see here, liquid nitrogen. Again, take a teeny amount of blood, and blood is an excellent physiological tissue that you can study the overall changes in individuals as they age. And the idea is to see, well, what happens in individuals as they age? What are bats doing to potentially slow down the aging process? What makes them really resistant to aging? And we bring this back to my lab, and we've designed lots of methods to be able to sequence the entire transcriptome, the message that's expressed in the DNA. And you can see here, there's a group of, it takes a lot of people. We catch over 700 bats a year. And we catch the same individuals year after year after year. We feed them, we release them. And these are our, our wonderful, I suppose, nearly a semi-wild population. They're wild, we're able to recapture them. You cannot keep these long-lived species of bat in the lab. So we asked the question, how do bats defy the aging process? We've lo looked at lots of different mechanisms, telomeres, we've looked at mitochondria, we look at the blood, we sequence the entire blood transcriptome. And I have to show you something. I'm very excited about this. This is eight years of work, this is the one figure. And the question is, what do the bats do? And really what we're beginning to find, looking at lots of different markers. So this is an example of looking at the transcriptome, looking at all of the message that's expressed in blood, and seeing do bats have a propensity for some other type of mechanisms. Do they switch some gene off, or switch some pathways, uh, switch it off or on as they age? What happens? When we look at bats, we compare them with humans, with mice, with wolves, these are the data that are available. What we find is extraordinary. As bats age, they increase the maintenance of their DNA. They're much better able to repair it. They repair their damage. And it's different. And we've looked at lots of different pathways and methodologies, but this is just, this is something, you know, it's over 100 bats we've looked at. So it seems that they're able to maintain their DNA. Potentially, this is what underlies the fact that there's really one recorded case ever in history that I can find of bats ever getting cancer. So don't get cancer either. So they've evolved these unique mechanisms. We've been also looking at what is it that regulates those mechanisms, and potentially it's microRNAs. We're working on this. But this gets get back to Schrodinger. An organism's astonishing gift of controlling the stream of order on itself and thus escaping the decay into atomic chaos. Existing order displays the power of maintaining itself. But I have in bold here, living matter evades decay to equilibrium. And it looks like bats are able to slow down the damage that happens to their DNA, their blueprint, to allow them to live much longer, healthier lives. That maybe this is what we need to do. So I'm going to quickly sum up the future of zoology by a quote by the amazing Francis Quick. Crick. Evolution is cleverer than you are. And we need to now look to nature to try and find solutions to our problems. We have the tools, we have the ways of integrating this different type of data. We have omics and transcriptomics and so forth. And here's an example. It's now going to be possible to sequence the genome to chromosome level exquisite detail of probably all of life. And here's an example of one of the projects. This is Earth Biogenome Project. It's a moonshot for biology that aims to sequence, catalog, and characterize the genomes of all of Earth's eukaryotic biodiversity of a period of 10 years. So we're now going to know the blueprint of all of life. That's extraordinary. We need to do a bit more than that. We're also going to need to prove that what we find in the genome that maybe underlies these unique adaptations really is doing what we think it's doing. And again, what we need to do is we now move into the lab. And this is what the part that I'm, I'm struggling with quite a lot. We need to move forward. We need to find some type of ex vivo, non-model organism assay. But how do we do this? I'm not going to be able to put 9 million of our eukaryotic organisms into the lab. I'm afraid a, blue head, a, a big, huge whale is going to be impossible to work with, and my head of school will not allow me to have elephants in the lab. So what are we going to do? We have all these new methodology now to be able to look at stem cells, gener generate them into any cell we want. And this is research developed for humans and model organisms. But we can now use these tools that I do all the time, developed for us and model organisms, to now go and do this. 
with maybe one or two individuals, get the cells, harvest them, isolate them, grow them in the lab, and test our hypothesis. And yes, that is a vampire bat. And then what are we going to do with this information? Well, we heard these fantastic talks about CRISPR. We're going to repair, we're going to rescue, we're going to change. Bet Shapiro talked about the idea of being able to modify black-footed ferrets with um, this resistance immune genes from a close living relative, we can do this. Or we can potentially go and modify the genome of our dwindling populations to make them look more look like the diversity they had in the past. We can go in and maybe make ours selves a bit more like bats. Put in bits of genes that maybe can allow our DNA to repair much better as we're older. Modify our regulation. The tools are already there. We can imagine this future. But to do this, we still need to know what parts of the tree of life should we look at. And this is Conor Durenz. He really was my inspiration to become a zoologist. And he won the Nobel Prize in 1973 for studying instinctive behavior and imprinting, along with Tim Bergen and Von Frisch. And now we have these new tools and technologies. Think about it. You can put a little camera into a nest in your own garden, looking at how these birds develop. And where I work in France, they have little cameras in the school where the bats are, and all the children see them coming in and leaving and so forth. We have so much technology now to study animals. We now have, we can put little tiny transponders on dragonflies and send it up to a satellite and understand more how these things move. We can understand animal behavior, and potentially animal consciousness. How do we know that a frog's idea of its intentional objective life is any less complex than a six-year-old girl. Do we really know that? Because we're not frogs. But maybe studying their behavior more will give us some insights. We have new recorded techniques, and we can find out what are these unique traits that all of life has. So I hope I ended this, that studying animals, the science of zoology, can allow us to understand much better what life is, what our place of life, what our place in life's diversity is, and how we can find solutions to grand challenges. Thank you.